Northstar. Um, my name is Dan Campbell. I'll be moderating. Uh, Northstar is a uh, web space um, that's going to be launched in a few days uh, to promote, uh, for the purpose of promoting radical left discourse um, from a variety of perspectives, for productive debate, analysis, discussion, etc. Um, and we'll be uploading our various panels, including this one, so check them out. Uh, it's the North Star Info. Uh, this panel is uh, called Left Third Party Organizing Challenges and Opportunities. So I think the title is pretty self explanatory, and I think we're just going to get into it and hear, hear what our panelists have to say about, about, about the topic. And I think I'm just going to introduce the panelists as we go. Um, so the first uh, speaker is uh, Seamus uh, Whelan. Uh, Seamus is a registered nurse, uh, an active union member, and an activist and socialist alternative. Uh, who is currently running for uh, Boston City Council. Thank you. I'm going to stand if that's okay. As Ben has said, I'm a, a working registered nurse. I've been a nurse for a long time, about 15 years, 16 years. Uh, I'm active in my union, which is the Mass Nurses Association. And Mass Nurses Association is affiliated to the National Nurses United which is 185,000 strong union. And it's one of the most progressive, uh, active unions, I think, in the country. Active, uh, a union that takes up uh, <coughs> social activism rather than just economic demands. Uh, and uh, <coughs> actually, last December, I was an elected delegate to the National Nurses United Conference. And I proposed a motion at that conference which called for the union to break from the parties of Wall Street, the Democrats and Republicans, and support independent candidates, uh, particularly as the establishment parties begin to attack social programs, attack the public sector, and public sector jobs and services. And that motion, will, uh, and also to combine an electoral strategy to a, a strategy of connecting with movements as movements begin to develop, and combine the two. Uh, and that motion was passed by uh, my union, the National Nurses United. Uh, so I'm a candidate, a social alternative candidate. We decided to run a candidate in Boston. Um, and uh, we're also, because uh, we, we believe there's an opportunity <coughs> exists at the moment. We're in the second term of an Obama administration. And more and more people are becoming disillusioned uh, with, with the Democrats. Uh, that they're carrying out the agenda of Wall Street and big business uh, and continuing the policies of the previous administration. Uh, and we believe there's a, a, an opening and a vacuum exists uh, that uh, you know, the, the left the progressives uh, should, uh, should look at. In fact, in last year, in 2012, uh, Social Alternative ran a candidate in Seattle, sorry, in Washington State, in a state rep uh, area, ran a candidate called Sharma Sawant. She ran as an open socialist, and she ran against the state's most powerful Democrat, the, the Speaker of the House, uh, of the Senate, I think. His name was Frank Chop, who had a reputation for budget cuts, and, and his, his name literally uh, did what his name actually said. Uh, he also had a reputation that the, the Washington State was a one-party uh, state. Uh, the Democrats control everything. Uh, and in that election, we had an incredible result against the state's most powerful Democrat, uh, with the, the candidate being a first-time candidate, running as an open socialist on a shoestring budget. She won over 20,000 votes, 29% of the vote, and really shook up the, the, the politics there. So to us, that really showed that, that there is an opportunity for independent left candidates uh, to, to run and to, uh, to make a, a big impact. Um, so, uh, also, she, she, uh, when Sharma ran, she, uh, she took on the agenda of, of the Democrats and the establishment politicians. She put forward a clear, uh, a clear alternative, an alternative to the budget cuts and austerity. Uh, and she called for the, the nationalization of the large corporations, of Microsoft, of uh, uh, Boeing, uh, in order to, well, when these companies, when you when you put forward the idea of taxing the corporations, they say, well, we're going to move. Uh, and from, from that, we, we were able to you know, get an echo for the demand of, of putting forward, of, of taking them over, 
uh, over public control, under democratic workers' uh, control and management. Uh, so this year, uh, we're running in Boston, but we're also running a sli uh, th uh, two other candidates. Sharma's running again in Seattle uh, for city council. And we have a candidate in Minneapolis called Ty Moore, who is one of the leaders of the uh, anti-foreclosure movement. I was able to establish an anti uh, uh, eviction zone in, in one district of, of Minneapolis, and uh, has re recently actually got arrested for standing up against some of the major banks there. And that campaign has, has, has really taken off. Uh, and it's, uh, it seems to be going uh, quite well. So we, we were expecting a, a really good uh, results from that. Um, in Boston, we, uh, we ran a candidate in 2007. And uh, that was quite a successful campaign where we took on the tax, budget cuts, uh, against the, all the other incumbents were Democrat type incumbents, uh, or Democrat type candidates. And we, uh, we won 3,000 votes at the time, which was quite, and had a real impact on the political debate. <coughs> After that, the establishment politicians, the Democrats, decided to make it much more difficult to get on the ballot. They uh, trebled the number of signatures, uh, of signatures of registered voters required for ballot access from 500 to 1,500, uh, which is actually means in reality you've got to collect about 3,000 uh, to safely get on the ballot. And they have the time needed to collect them from six weeks to three weeks. So that, that was a big challenge for, for us this time uh, running. And in the first week we went out to collect signatures, we got over around 2,000 signatures. Uh, and actually, we were uh, there, there are still counting signatures, but we were one of the first three to actually uh, meet the bar uh, to uh, be certified the for election. So to us, that, that's uh, that speaks like uh, success. Also, we were able to mobilize a campaign, a team of volunteers, of members, of supporters to actually go out. So we hope to continue that, that, that uh, success. Um, but it's, we realize it's quite difficult for an independent uh, you know, a small independent uh, campaign, a small uh, socialist group to actually take on uh, the establishment politicians who have tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, dollars in their campaign coffers. Uh, and Boston at the moment, the, 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 what's happening in Boston is that the mayor, the long-term mayor of Boston, Mayor Menino, has resigned. And that has opened up a kind of floodgates of every career politician to actually get in the race uh, uh, to take over the, the throne. Uh, so there's a number of city councillors who have actually jumped in, into the race for mayor. I think there's about 24 declared candidates. I'm not sure many have been certified. But uh, that has also created uh, a domino effect in the city council race. Uh, I'm running as an at-large candidate for the whole of Boston, and there's four at-large seats. Uh, and 27 candidates declared for that. And I think uh, yesterday or the day before, I. 18 have been certified. Uh, so on one hand, that uh, has, uh, makes it more difficult to get out your message when there's so many other candidates, to get attention. Uh, but also it creates an opportunity. And that all those candidates, pretty much all those candidates are the same. They're advocating the same position or, or really not taking on the issues affecting working people. Uh, so for a socialist candidate and a candidate that calls for uh, a change from the politics as usual, that the working class shouldn't have to pay for the crisis caused by the corporations and the rich, and uh, putting forward clear uh, uh, policies, uh, alternative policies, that this creates an opportunity that for us to stand out uh, and to actually, the percentage of the vote we actually need is somewhat less uh, because of so many candidates in the race. Um, so, just to finish up, uh, last few minutes I have. Um, I think uh, we're not running a campaign in, in, in either the, city, in, in the cities we're running in because we want to develop political careers. We're running as activists because we want to introduce, uh, we, we want to change society. We also don't see the individual positions as positions that will in themselves change much. Uh, but we're using this campaign uh, to, to present, to set an example to the movement. Uh, and I would encourage people to, uh, you know, check out our campaign and to, uh, you know, to, to get involved if you can. You know, come visit us in Seattle, Boston, Minneapolis. Uh, also, we're advocating a different type of politics. What we're saying is that if elected, 
we will not take the full wage that city council gets paid. We will just take an average worker's wage in Boston and the rest of the money we will donate into build campaigns to build social movements which will actually help bring real change. So we're presenting a vision actually. And in 2012, we, put, we uh, produced a video called uh, uh, What If You Had 200 Volunteers or 200 Occupy Candidates? Uh, and that's the kind of vision we're putting forward to, to bring real change. You know, we, we need to, uh, we, we need to, uh, there's, a, there's an opportunity to, to run and uh, if, instead of having the same choice, the choice of lesser evilism, you know, between the, the candidates that were presented at the election cycle, we need to put forward, you know, alternative candidates, candidates that are not funded by corporate donations, that are, are, are taking up community campaigns and community issues. And we see this, just to finish this last point, we see this as a step, um, a step towards what is really needed, and the building of a mass workers' labor party that, that is, will be able to incorporate the struggles of working people and, and the issues that are facing them, but also struggles of the environment, struggles, community struggles, and all these struggles can be combined into one political entity that, that will be that will represent our interests rather than the interests of Wall Street and the banks. And that would have an historic effect on the consciousness of U.S. Uh, workers. That U.S. The working people would see that their interests uh, the consciousness of their interests are separate from the interests of the corporations uh, and we will break from the corporate politics into a new form of politics which would uh, be able to maybe consolidate and uh, develop the struggles to develop, would give them a political voice and to develop the consciousness of the American working class. Uh, to do that, you know, I think a successful campaign in, in the cities we're running is very important and it's something that I think everybody that, that's concerned with, with working class politics, with environment politics, should you know, take note of and get involved in it. And in that, one of the biggest, uh, uh, I, I would make an appeal, I've, I've uh, distributed some of uh, our election material, but also there's a, a financial uh, sheet, I have several copies of it, I encourage people to uh, donate to campaign. In order to have a viable campaign, we need to compete against you know, the large corporate donations that flood into politics at the moment. And I'd uh, urge people, if I can pass this around, to, to consider you know, giving as much as you can to our campaign. Thank you. Thanks, Seamus. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Ursula Rosam. Ursula was the Green Party candidate for Congress in uh, New York's 24th district uh, in 2012 when she won 8% of the vote. Uh, she works at the Syracuse Peace Council. Hi. Um, I'm to grab my cell phone so I can tell my well, that's not my backpack. Yeah, like I have exactly that. Let me start with that. That's a big problem in the airport. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks for inviting me. And I really like I really enjoy talking about my campaign experience and the experience of building um, the Green Party in Central New York. Um, I've been involved with the Greens since about 2010. I had previously before that um, worked with the Working Families Party in, um, in upstate New York as well as um, an organization called Citizen Action. And basically, Citizen Action and Working Families Party, anyone that's familiar with um, New York State fusion politics, basically serve as get out the vote front groups for the Democratic Party and allow them to posture as progressives when really they don't implement any of the policies that these organizations claim to stand for. And I feel like I have, can give a little bit more insight to that if folks want later on. But um, I do have some experience working um, for about two years um, on and off with those organizations. Um, I entered the race uh, for Congress. It was actually at Left Forum last year that I said I was going to do it. And um, I was thinking a lot about um, just a lot of the issues that, that had really people had gotten really fired up about during the Occupy movement, and um, things like it was. It just I felt like all of a sudden I knew all these people that were thinking about the issues that I cared about, whether it was the wars, the climate crisis, austerity, and I was looking at the choices that we had for our congressional representative, which were basically a conservative Democrat that had previously held office 
and an incumbent um, two-party Republican. And the choices were pretty discouraging. And we knew that this was going to be the race that had um, prime media attention on it in our region. And that, you know, we were going to be, people were going to be spoon-fed these lies that, you know, that the Democrats are the solution to the fascist Republicans, when really the Democrat that we were running, I was running against had been doing things like promoting um, um, tax, break, tax breaks for um, repur what's it called? reappropriation of foreign profits, for example, um, and had supported the, the bank bailout back at, right around election time in 2008. Hadn't you know, said anything about health care, basically went along with Obamacare. Had requested millions of dollars for the, the development of drones in central New York when he had previously held office. Um, and the, you know, the list goes on of different ways that you know, they posture as progressive, but really act very conservatively. But on the other side was a climate change denying um, Tea Party Republican. And the pushback, you know, the, the, the liberal establishment basically was, was freaking out during our campaign because they thought, oh, you know, this collective wearing, collective living, nose ring wearing person, she's not going to get any attention. Who's going to pay attention to this, you know, newcomer? But it was really the hot media story of the of the election cycle was that whoa there's this wild card candidate in the race, and in Central New York, um, the Greens had because Howie Hawkins, um, who many know, he's run for New York governor um, mm -hmm. two years ago. Um, he's kind of developed a fairly good reputation for the Green Party, and we've developed very good relationships with the media. And so my campaign was able to, you know step on, you know, use that reputation we've, um, we've developed, and um, it turns out that when you're a candidate and, and you're talking about things like jobs for all and a climate action plan, um, people like that. People pay attention. And um, I went from, you know, no one knowing about me to about 8% in the polls a couple weeks before election day. And typically, um, well, this is what Howie says anyway, he was my campaign manager, that on election day, actually, people change their minds and you don't do as well as was expected. But actually, you know, I got exactly what the polls had said, 8%, 22,000 votes. And the really interesting thing that we saw after the election was we saw the results, and the, my best showing was in the much more economically distressed areas and what's considered the, the working class sections of our city and of our district. For example, there's a very economically distressed county, Oswego County, where everyone works at the nuclear power plant or they don't have a job. Um, and it was really the sections of, of our district that are the typical, like the, li the liberal educated sections where I did very poorly. So we thought that was very interesting that, you know, people really respond to our progressive program. And um, it was, I mean, I think one of the opportunities of running a third party campaign is you, you get this megaphone, people pay attention to you and you can talk about things like taxing the rich and implementing <coughs> progressive taxes um, and you have to really, it, you know, you have to work really hard to try to, to distinguish yourself from the Democrats because I got a lot of um, hate mail like, oh, you're just Democrat light. And, um, <coughs> but you know, the Democrats were talking about you know, a very minimal progressive taxes, and we were talking about things like Eisenhower era graduated income tax rates. And um, the Climate Action Plan we talked about included things like um, democratic control of the energy sector, which is something that's fairly um, um, known, I guess the concept is fairly popular in upstate New York because we do have public power utilities, and we've seen public power utilities developing in sections that are actually much more conservative um, so when you start explaining to folks that, oh, well, we can actually have cheaper power and the, the um, revenues aren't going to go to some profit-seeking corporation, you know, while the, the leaders of the parties, of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, they come up with all these reasons why these things, you know, aren't desirable. Actual voters, regular people, just regardless of their registration, they respond to these things. And so I think that's one of the greatest opportunities of running a, a, a third-party campaign is that... Unlike being a street activist, um, people actually, they think that you're credible, like they think that your opinions matter if you're able to present them in a, you know, in an articulate way. Um, and things, you know, we're able to talk about things 
like have solutions to the climate crisis, have the ability to also address the jobs crisis. I ran on the platform that Jill Stein ran on, basically, the Green New Deal, and um, people responded really well to it. Um, and so, let's see, it was, it was a pretty tough race because it was considered one of the um, primary, um, they called it like the red to blue Democratic Party pickups. And so there was a lot of pushback, even from, I work at a peace organization, and it was pretty, it was a pretty trying time because there was definitely factions in the peace move, you know, in the local peace organization, um, to the point where we, you know, we had an intervention, you know, so a lot of activists, you know, circling me and saying, you've already won, we've paid attention to you. But, um, you know, part of my thought, thinking towards the end of the campaign was that so many people locally had either volunteered or donated some money or were putting up lawn signs that it really didn't feel like the campaign was about just me, the candidate. It was all these people were like, yes, we want a new kind of politics. We don't trust the corporate parties. And so at some point, it really did feel like a small mo local movement that was um, separate from the corporate parties. And um, I'll tell you that also, you know, the other opposition that came out was from the liberal groups that basically um, work to do get out the vote for the Democrats. Um, basically, there was a lot of, uh, you basically, they pretend you don't exist. And then the debates happen, and people see you, and we start getting emails like, I'm so upset at my union, or I'm, I can't believe that you weren't on the Planned Parenthood voter guide. All these things start coming in, and people start getting really upset, like they've been lied to. And so it's like these other organizations are all of a sudden like creating this really favorable environment for us. Like people are like, whoa, we have a choice. There is an alternative. Um, so, you know, I think I was, think, I really appreciated the way the panel description was, um, it was written, that it was, there were a lot of questions that you presented that I think really helped, that I want to just reflect on in the last few minutes is that, yeah, uh, people, people are ready for an alternative. Um, the economy sucks, we have a climate crisis, we've been talking about all these different movements that exist and people go to vote and they rarely have a decent choice. A significant percentage of the US voting public doesn't vote and I, I kind of don't blame them. You know, one of the things I would say during, was saying during my campaign and people thought it was irresponsible was that if I wasn't running, I probably wouldn't vote for either of my opponents. And so I think that people are ready for options. And um, in, in New York State anyway, a lot of local races are unopposed. Um, it's either it's Democrats or Republicans, and there's, there is an opportunity, and I don't know how it is in other states for people that aren't here, um, that aren't from here. So I would also say that, you know, in New York State, an opportunity the left has right now is that um, the Greens are very open to working with people that want to run as independent candidates. Um, sure, we're the Green Party, but one of our, you know, key values is you know, decentralization and grassroots democracy, and if you want to work with the party and, you know, you agree with our platform, then, you know, we're happy to have people um, that are strong candidates that um, can articulate, you know, our policies run. And I think we're seeing this and with the socialist alternative that across the country there are a couple of candidates that are working with the Green Party as well. Um, what else? Um, one of the things asked, one of the things I did hear from a lot of people was, you know, would you ever run as a Democrat? And I said, well, no, I'm not a Democrat. And, you know, I was working on, I worked on Howie Hawkins' 2010 campaign for governor. And that year he ran against Andrew Cuomo. And Andrew Cuomo received twice as much money from the Koch brothers as the Republican governor of Wisconsin, Scott Walker. So to me, <laughs> you know, it's, for me, running, running in the Democratic primary, in the Democratic Party primary would be like legitimizing this alliance with 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 the capitalists, with corporations, and also giving just credence to this lie that they stand for the um, interests of working people, of the environment, of social movements. Um, what we're seeing right now in New York State is this horrible economic policy, this austerity, and just you know giveaways to big business. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Tax Free New York that um, yeah. Andrew Cuomo is promoting. But the sad thing is that, you know, it's really hard to counter it because 
he also supports gay marriage, and he has a women's rights agenda that, you know, guarantees access to abortion that has already been guaranteed in New York anyway. And, you know, the women's equality agenda is in itself a very, it's a, it's a good thing for women's rights, but by creating these kinds of, um, promoting these kind of more liberal things that are kind of social, um, project, social, I guess, how do you say it, um, it's social issues, it allows for the, you know, promotion of a really conservative economic agenda. So it's pretty scary looking to see what the Democratic Party is doing in New York State. Um, and so when people ask me, would you ever run in a Democratic primary, I say no. But that doesn't mean that I don't believe in working with Democrats. And, you know, we have local alliances on issues. Um, when there's progressive Democrats running, we don't try to run against them. So um, I think that it's, you know, you don't have to run in the Democratic primary to, to work with the Democrats. So, okay, thank I'll you. Leave it at that. All right, the next uh, panelist is uh, Carl Davidson. Carl is a veteran peace and justice organizer. He was leader of the 1960s uh, New Left. Uh, today is a national co-chair of the committees uh, for, of correspondence uh, for democracy and socialism and a national board member of the Solidarity Economy Network. He lives in western Pennsylvania and is a member of Pittsburgh Fight Back and Local 3657 of the United Steel Workers. The rest of the list is way too long. You know? uh, I've been involved in uh, electoral politics for 50 years. And uh, over that time, I've been on all sides of it. I've uh, voted Communist Party, I've voted Socialist Workers Party, I've voted Socialist Labor Party. I worked to build the Labor Party such as it was. I was a member of the Green Party. I was a member of the New Party, recruited Obama, worked with Obama as a New Party member, uh, worked for Jesse Jackson, worked in the Harold Washington campaign, helped launch progressives for Obama. Um, Citizens Party, very common. I was part of the Citizens Party. I know where all the bodies are buried <laughs> on all sides of this debate. <laughs> uh, to me, the most important thing is to try to find some fresh thinking, some new ideas about how to approach this. Because some of the, some of the argument, frankly, is boring. I've heard it for 50 years, and you know, like I say, I know, and I've been on both sides of it. I've worked in all of these different fronts. I've worked as uh, you know, build independent parties, and I've worked in with the Democrats and so on. And I learned par par politics in Chicago, hardball. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one challenge I often throw out to the left is you, what the left really needs to do when it comes to electoral politics is you need to raise your consciousness. So it's at least as high as the level of the average Chicago precinct captain. <laughs> What does the average Chicago precinct captain know? He has a list of everybody in the precinct. He knows their birthdays. He knows who's registered to vote and who's not registered to vote. He knows when they're going to become registered to vote. He knows what their issues are. He has them marked plus, minus, zero. Plus means he's with them. Minus means he's working with the independents to the other side. Zero, they're in between. He knows them all. He's on a personal relationship with them. When they have a problem, they come to the precinct captain. He helps them solve it. How many leftists can say that about their neighborhood? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very little. So when you really want to do politics, number one, you have to have at least the kind of understanding and relationships with the masses that the average Chicago precinct captain does. That's number one. Mm -hmm. My big <laughs> argument, I joined the Green Party in Chicago, my big argument with them was, I said, you want to run against? I said, great. I said, let's run, let's run some candidates. Pick Chicago's three biggest problems. Write the green solution to those problems, and give me a list of them that I can take door to door. Because that's what I need to go door to door against uh, Daly's guy. They just know. They wanted to run on the ten principles. I tried to get them to do that twice. I went to the meetings. They were interested in running in the most liberal district to take down Jan Schakowsky, rather than the district next door, which was Rahm Emanuel. Why did they want to take down Jan Schakowsky? Because that's where they could get the most votes. They couldn't get as many votes if they went against Rahm Emanuel. 
So I said, thanks, but no thanks. You know, <laughs> I have better things to do with my time than that kind of tactics. My view is that all of these things are matters of tactics. Strategically, my view is that I'm united with everybody strategically on this panel. Strategically, we have the same aim, which is to break up the Democratic Party and to give the working class a political instrument that can bring it to rule, bring it to rule society. Those are the easy parts. The hard part is how you get from here to there, how you go about breaking up the Democratic Party. And here's where you get into two kinds of politics. The two kinds of politics that we face in this country, and have faced at least since 1968, you can put in two big baskets. Politics as self-expression and politics as strategy. Both, I don't mean to put either of them down, both are important. Politics as self-expression serves to unite a militant minority and to express its views and to build and expand the militant minority. As a result, it runs a revolutionary educational campaign. The politics of strategy, the aim is to unite a progressive majority and to win, to win the election. And it's a broader alliance than a militant minority. It's a left center or a broader front. Chokwe Lumumba is a good example of the latter politics as strategy, where he, he was a militant minority revolutionary one, but through judicious work, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party is its instrument, taking advantage of the conditions in Mississippi, the open primaries that the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party can run in the Democratic Party primary, win, and then blow away the division among uh, the adversary camp and unite 85% of the vote. <coughs> Him. And so now we have a radical, even revolutionary guy elected on the Democratic line as mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. Lennon often liked to quote Goethe, you know, theory is gray, life is green. In Chicago, we ran against, we ran Harold Washington. We split the Democratic Party in three. <laughs> Daly and the real estate interests and the hardcore of the Democratic Party ran on the unity ticket. Act, Fast Eddie, he gathered the gangsters that were in the Democratic Party and ran on the solidarity ticket. And what was left was the black community, the Latino community, the few of the labor leaders and the 60s new leftists and the Rainbow Coalition. And we had the Democratic Party ticket. So if you wanted to vote against Democrats in that election, who did you vote for? The only way to really vote against the Democratic Party in that election was to vote for the Democratic ticket. <laughs> because the real Democratic Party was on the solidarity ticket and the unity ticket. That's what Lenin meant, or Goethe meant, when theory is gray, but life is green. These things can get very dicey when you get down to the details. I work today my tactic today is I want to see, I think, uh, I would like to see the Democratic Party go to the way, go the way the Whigs did uh, prior to the Civil War. I'd like to see it implode and I'd like to see a new forces arise out of it. I don't think that's only going to happen from the outside. Fortress is also conquered from the inside by exacerbating the differences within it. So I follow a party within a party strategy. I work with PDA, Progressive Democrats of America, which, besides its name, is an independent PAC. It doesn't belong to the Democratic Party. It's an independent PAC. It runs candidates in Democratic Party elections, and it works on their working class and African American side of the fault lines within the Democratic Party. That's where we build our base. We have an organization of 200 or so people in Beaver County, where I work. Almost all blue collar workers to a fault. We don't have enough intellectuals around. Them. <laughs> we have a platform out now from the wars, Medicare for all, uh, green jobs, uh, debt relief. Um, those are our key platform planks, and uh, we are tightly connected with the Congressional Progressive Caucus. 
that's the relationship we do have with the Democratic Party. To really understand politics in the U.S. today, we do not have a two-party system. We do not have a one-party system. If you want to have an, a hypothesis that will give you explanatory power about politics in the U.S. today, we have a six-party system. We have the Tea Party, we have the multinational Republicans, we have the Blue Dog Democrats, we have the New Democrat Clintonistas, representing finance capital, we have old New Dealers, which are a, labor, a lot of the AFL-CIO labor-based, and we have the Congressional Progressive Caucus slash PDA, <coughs> which is the, the expression we have of our popular fund against finance capital. I'm for working with that last one. That's what, that's what I work, and I want to exacerbate the contradictions with the right wing and to see that party eventually implode along with the Republican Party so we can create something new out of the wreckage. That's what I'm uh, about. Uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, you don't have to convince me that the Democratic Party is the instrument of finance capital. I, there's no argument. That's a, you know, as plain as the nose on your face. You don't have to convince me that we're not going to get to socialism through the Democratic Party. I don't even think we're going to get to socialism through elections. We're not going to elect our way to socialism, but I guarantee you in this country that we get to socialism through elections. We have to exhaust them, not in your mind or my mind, but in the eyes of the masses, because they are the ones who make history. In my county, half of the <coughs> workers vote Republican. The other half vote Democrat. Maybe 2% would consider a third party. Among unionized workers, even among unionized workers, a third vote Republican. So we have to find ways to form a struggle, to move these people to the left, encourage them to build their own organizations, and in our case, PDA is an organization owned and controlled by the working class in western Pennsylvania, and to begin to shift uh, their consciousness by engaging in struggles that we, not only we are willing to wage, but more importantly, what they are willing to do. Okay, thank you. Um, our last speaker is uh, Tim Horace. Tim is uh, the chair of Philly Socialists, which is an independent Philadelphia-based grassroots political organization founded in 2011. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to quick go through a, a whole bunch of points. I'm going to, again, take a, I really appreciate all of the nitty-gritty details that our candidates bring. That's really cool. I'm going to try to get like a little bit more of a, a broader perspective in the way that, that Carl was uh, was kind of alluding to. So um, yeah, obviously the two-party system is like a, a key issue um, in the United States, um, and the the characteristics of the fact that we have this parliamentary system that is a really old one, you know, in terms of the comparable to other like countries, um, is a pretty big deal. But that it hasn't actually prevented the rise of new parties. For those of you who aren't familiar um, with what uh, Carl Davidson was talking about with the Whigs, they actually predated the Republican Party, um, for those of you who don't know about U.S. history, and then they split over the slavery issue. It was such a huge deal at that time. The society was so in conflict with itself that the party itself just split apart. And one of the interesting things about that period, if you, if you know anything about this, but there were many attempts to create third parties. So there was the Liberty Party first. And that failed, right? And then there was the Free Soilers, and that didn't work out so well either. Finally, they came up like with you know a new party, which was a Republican Party that finally caught on enough where you know it became a national party that we know today. So one of the things I just wanted to put out there is that you know failure is not a bad thing. Sometimes different iterations need to be tried, and like you know the contributions can all be learned from. Um, so I'm. I, I was going to touch about this maybe later if we want to talk a little bit in the q and I think that there is like a difference between a, a mass party and, and more of a vanguard organization. I think that those sorts of organizational structures um, can do different things and that, um, that one of the reasons that the bourgeoisie has had such hegemony in the United States is that they have this big tent like for the parties in the way that Carl's talking about where they have wildly divergent um, sort of ideological positions, but yet retain unity under, um, you know, the leadership of, like, the ruling class. So, um, I do want to just mention that there have been, um, I wouldn't, that's pretty much it from my analysis, other than there's also a really interesting thing about, like, local elections, and the fact that there's a history of, you know, third parties that have won a lot of uh, local elections and, and really built kind of a culture 
Um, one, of the, one of the greatest examples of this is the Farmer Labor Party, which eventually actually got to be so big that it merged with the Democratic Party. So um, one of the states actually doesn't have a Democratic Party. They have like a, a Farmer Labor Democratic Party, um, a very progressive state. Um, the next point I just want to touch on is are we nearing an inflection point? Is, is the, you know, Carl rightly pointed out this, a lot of this debate has been happening for years and years. Are we living in a time period that's different than, you know, when they had this debate like 10 or 15, 20 years ago, you know? That's a good question. I would, my thesis would be that we actually were in a slightly different period. Um, a couple of the reasons for that is, number one, the demographics are changing. I don't think that we're going to have overnight, like, the opportunity for a third party. But we do have to look at the changing di demographics. I'm a believer that demographics is destiny. So you have the rise of the Latino voting bloc. I just wanted to pull out a really interesting thing for me. Um, I was reading Fox News Latino, and they're talking about how, well, I'm going to quote here, while the number of Latino voters rose between 2008 and 2012 by 1.4 million, turnout was lower in 2012 than in 2008. And the Latino tr turnout dropped 2%. And the number of Latino non-voters grew by 2.3 million. As Paul Taylor, executive president of Pew Research Center, put it, given what we know about the youth bulge in the population, millennials and Hispanics will become ever more important voting blocks in upcoming elections, but in 2012, both groups left a lot of votes on the table. So what that's not saying is that there's an opportunity for a third-party candidate like Ralph Nader to just come in and just, you know, wipe the floor of people, but there, is a, there are openings, and, and we're in a period of contestation, right, which I think is why it's great to be, you know, running candidacies and so on. Um, the other demographic that I was talking about was the millennials, which is, you know, the one that I'm, the demographic I'm most comfortable with it's uh, the demographic that the organization that, I, um, that I'm the chair of uh, recruits mostly. And it was one of the key, you know, sort of cadre demographics that represented Occupy Wall Street was the young people. And not just Occupy Wall Street, but what's going on right now in Turkey and all over the world. You have this sort of the youth bulge is what they're calling it, the demographers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that is like, to my mind, a revolutionary class. Maybe not the, you know, revolutionary class is going to overthrow everybody, you know, or not everybody. But the, you know, it really changed like the situation, and maybe and not a class in, in the Marxist sense, but a demographic that's that's oriented basically toward a more revolutionary, you know, sort of politics. Um, if the real key question to me is about this you know, inflection point is the economy, um, I think liberals are very optimistic that there's like a recovery. I've been hearing that they were in a recovery for years and years, actually. So, you know, I hope everybody enjoys it. Um, I, I think that one of the things, you know, I'm not, I can't, I don't have time to go into this, but I think we have to look at the economy and say, are, are we going to get jobs back? Like, are, are we going to go back to like sort of a Keynesian period in the 60s where, you know, everybody has jobs and we have like these strong unions? I don't think so. I think we have to build a strategy based on that for the foreseeable future. But I, and I think that is a positive in some ways because it can have the potential to radicalize people. Um, the next point is like, yeah, when we really look, look at the local level, um, I think that it's really a case-by-case -case basis when, like, um, you know, third-party candidates should be run. I really don't like the sort of propagandistic, like, educational, like, uh, thing, because so many educational, like, um, there's a great book by Eric Davin, the scholar, who couldn't be here today, but he wrote that, you know, socialists have been running educational uh, candidates for so long, why doesn't anybody know anything about socialism, right? <laughs> um, which I think is a good point. I think that um, another thing, too, is, like, working-class people want to trust folks who are going to fight that they feel are committed to victory. Maybe not victory immediately, but victory in the long term. And that's what they're going to be behind, not like sort of like, well, we want to make a statement. Carl, again, put it, uh, the kind of juxtaposition between the politics of personal expression and, I guess, what you say, strategic. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, on the local level, you know, we got to look where, you know, machines are weak, you know. I, where I'm at in Philadelphia, um, they actually just had an election. They, they couldn't get, there were like places where they only got five people out. And the, the papers have been complaining about, oh, you know, the youth don't vote and they're not interested in local politics. And, you know, there are actually, we need to really study historically where there have been party realignments in Philadelphia. The last one was in the 1920s, roughly, like, there was a, a whole period of struggle. But um, between, there used to be a Republican machine then a Democratic machine. We need to really seriously see how that kind of change happens and try to draw as many lessons as we can. So my last point will be just kind of some um, ideas for action. Um, I think that what Seamus was saying about the, um, the whole avoiding electoralism, you know, um, and I think that there's a general consensus among people on, think, on the panel that elections are not going to get us like the changes we want to see. 
So we can't just be using, you know, uh, tactics as a strategy. We can't just be running elections and hoping that that will, like, bring everything. It has to be part of a broader strategy, and I think everybody's on board about that. Um, I already mentioned being opposed to educational campaigns. Building locally, um, a great example of this, I wrote a, a brief essay about the history of the Vermont Progressive Party, which, for those of you who don't know that much about it, it's a third party that was built. Um, Bernie Sanders, obviously, was a part of that, but he was never directly like linked with it. Um, and whatever you think of their politics, they built over you know a period of 10 or 15 years a party that actually has people in power and has negotiating ability on the local level. And I think that that's like a really important model that we should look to when the context is correct for places. Maybe in Beaver County, it's not the best thing to do, but there may be other areas that you know a candidate like that or a, a party building strategy like that might be useful um, for you know linking up nationally down the road and converging like down the road. Um, so yeah, I agree um, too with what Carl was saying that like you know I don't think that there's 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 really no reason to like be criticizing people on you know working within the Democratic Party with them without. Um, I definitely fall on the outside. I wouldn't, you know, I'm not a, a Democrat myself, but I think that the idea of heightening the contradictions with, from within is also a useful activity, and there's no reason that we need to, like, you know, throw stones at each other. We can be just encouraging folks to, like, do their thing and, like, yeah, you know. Um, the, other, the thing we have to be aware of, and I think is the danger, is co-option. And I think the most egregious example in, in U.S. history of bourgeois co-option was the Bryant campaign. Um, for those of you who know a little bit about history, right, there was this massive new party, the populists, and they gained a lot of support with a pretty, very radical, like, agrarian sort of, like, socialistic program. Um, they went through all the same kind of fights that happen, you know, that, that we're talking about and so on. Um, finally, the, 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 what happened was they got a Democrat who had the, almost the exact same platform and then when he lost, then the, the party dissolved. And people, of course, went different ways. Some people went to the Democrats. Some people went off and do their own thing. So um, that is like a serious uh, <coughs> you know, potential blunder in the road. And I think that one of the positives about Occupy is there was always the idea that Occupy was going to be remaining independent. It was, it was an independent entity. And I think that, that sort of um, attitude is something that we need to take as an independent working class strategy. Um, and then uh, the last really quick point I'm just going to make is that we need to look at like you know what how the bourgeoisie wins elections. Um, there's a great book called Victory Lab um, about the use of big data and actually how they win elections on the national level. The Obama campaign, incredible, uh, incredible operation. We need to be learning from our enemies. And then the point that Carl said about embeddedness and the Chicago precinct captain. I think ultimately politics comes down to relationships. And if you don't know, like, the people that you're asking to vote, then you're not going to vote, you know? So that's my speech. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we'll give the panelists uh, an opportunity to respond to the points made by the fellow panelists. I don't know if anybody wants to jump in and be keep it to three, four minutes. Sure, I'll, I'll respond. Um, you know, I so the office I ran for was a congressional office. Um, basically, for this idea, for the idea of bringing attention to the fact that there are alternatives that we can have independent, we have we can have non-corporate parties, with the end of you know strengthening awareness of the alternatives for local races. And one of the articles I really liked that I read recently was the one by Gar Elperowitz on this idea of the checkerboard strategy. When you get um, when you have either pro progressives or you know radicals in office, you can implement local policies that help to um, build local control, democratic control, and use things like public services to really develop um, local wealth. And so I think um, using, every state has very different requirements on how to get on the ballot. And so when we talk about strategy and electoral strategy, I think it's really important to recognize that you're, you're understanding, I think, Carl, from what you said, you've been doing it all over the place, so you probably know a little bit more about the different challenges to actually run for office in different states. So, you know, for like the Greens, people are like, oh, well, a presidential race makes no sense. But for some state parties, they need to have a presidential candidate on the ballot to actually have ballot status and to exist as a political party. But, um, yeah, so um, in Syracuse, we're very much focused on local opportunities. Um, our public power campaign has been very popular um, to have municipally owned po power um, among Republicans and non-Republicans you know, non and Democrats. So I think that... <coughs> Local, I think local power is definitely 
what we want to be building and the relationship building. I think it's very, it's, an, it's awesome. I think it's really good to learn from your enemies because they're so good at it. You know, one of the things that we I thought I've been thinking about recently is that a lot of what the big campaigns do, the well-funded campaigns, is they don't do movement building. They're doing marketing. Mm -hmm. And so, and what we what we want to do is we don't want to do marketing. We want movement building. And one of the challenges that I think we see is that. People are really swayed by the marketing, and so it's one of the challenges to movement building is that newer, I think newer people that are just kind of getting politically conscious or aware or active are much more susceptible to the marketing. So I think we have to think about that when we're doing our organizing and movement building that, you know, people are easily, easily um, uh, attracted by the, much, the groups that have much more resources and that make, that make it seem easier because this work of the party building, running elections, it's really a lot of work. And so I think that it's one of their challenges is to get people in that are in for the long haul and understand you're not going to just build some successful independent party overnight. James, any responses? I'm hoping maybe you could also speak to how uh, your, your own campaign fits in sort of tactically with these larger strategic perspectives that Tim and maybe Carl spoke, spoke about a little. Yeah, I, I think a, a number of important questions have come up of when to run, why to run. And um, I, I agree with the point that you know the the consciousness that there's, since Occupy there has been a significant change in the consciousness. Occupy raised <coughs> the whole idea in a generalized way that there are two classes uh, in society. Uh, and you know running in elections one reason to run is, is that to build a movement. To, to increase the consciousness and to build a movement. Uh, now, you don't have to just run an election to do that. There are other ways and other strategies uh, to, to do that. Uh, but where, where there is the opportunity and where there is a credible campaign, uh, I think it's important to do that. Uh, within my situation in Boston, one of the reasons in, in uh, just on Occupy also, during the Seattle campaign, we were trying to affect Occupy activists to, to move that movement into community campaigns, taking up issues like evictions, but also to move those activists into, to run for, to use the, the, the momentum of Occupy to run for office. And we weren't successful now, unfortunately. Within Boston, uh, the people with the resources, the organizations that can actually run credible campaigns, there are a number of organizations, but particularly the trade unions. Uh, I don't agree with, with a lot of what Carl said in regards to reforming the Democratic Party. I think in general, the Democratic Party is an abusive relationships movements have with the Democratic Party. You know, the Democratic Party will use some progressives as a safety valve, and are a necessary safety valve, because if there was a this progressive or whatever, that, 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 that was able to take movements and suck them in, and then placate them and allow them to die down. The Democratic Party is the death knell of social movements. We've seen that with the anti-war movement, the Wisconsin movement. So I don't think you can reform the Democratic Party, you need a new party. My aim within, within Boston, particularly within the m and is to, to popularize the idea of, you, you, particularly among the union activists and the base of the union, of the need to run and to use the resources of, of, of the unions to run independent uh, candidates to the establishment of Democratic Party candidates. Okay, uh, Tim or Carl, do you have any responses? Or? Yeah, I have a big response. I, I never mentioned once reforming the Democratic Party. I think anybody who wants to reform the Democratic Party is nuts. <laughs> I'm against it. <laughs> I want to break it up. My tactics are about breaking up the Democratic Party, not reforming it. And I think one of the ways you break it up is you build a faction within it that will press it on reforms it claims to stand for. And that's a way to help exacerbate the Democratic Party, the, the contradictions in the Democratic Party, and eventually <clears throat> to the breaking point especially if you have a mass struggle behind it. Uh, that's one point I want to make. On your point, marketing versus movement building, I'm against both. I'm not saying I'm against both, I'm, I'm for both, but I don't think either of them are primary. What is primary is organization building. Movements come and go, movements ebb and flow. The waves will come in, the waves will go out. What really is important is how much you can consolidate the wave when it's flowing so that you, when it goes out, the next time the wave comes in, you have an organization that you can count on that's at a higher place than it was before. 
So organization building is what I see as key. Not just the party, but all kinds of organization. So organization building, to me, trumps both movement building and marketing. Okay, so let's be good. All right, so I think uh, this is be a pretty diverse uh, audience. That we'll uh, open it up for a lot of questions. So yeah, maybe we'll go here first. And I'll take two questions at a time, if that's all right. So here, and then, and then Matt, and then, yeah. All right, well, thank you. Uh, my name is Peter from Brooklyn, member of Social Alternative. And I think it's been an interesting panel. I mean, we've got a broad spectrum. I mean, I think Seamus and Ursula are kind of the closest on the panel in terms of ideas. I mean, Seamus pretty more clearly, you know, that, that we cannot cooperate with Democrats. And, he, you know, Ursula, you know, saying a little bit that maybe in some instances, but pretty more clear in that. Uh, Tim, I'm not 100% sure exactly exactly where you stand, but, uh, you know, and then uh, Carl views uh, more the idea of uh, working from within the Democrats, or at least to some extent. But I think one thing that's kind of clouds our thinking historically in America about what it means to build a labor party or an independent third party is the fact that parties in the, in the real sense of organizations that have grassroots structures that mm. develop policy through ba grassroots democracy and that funnels upwards is, you know, been an anomaly or really isn't, hasn't existed in a mass sense uh, in the American political scene throughout most of the history, right? So we have these bizarre big tent organizations that, you know, try to allow for everybody's, you know, individualism, but in the end, end up catering to the corporate interest. Um, and I want to challenge, uh, uh, it, is, it is Tim, right? Yeah. yeah. I, want to, I want to challenge Tim on one point, I mean, you did say that demography is destiny. Demography is, I, I mean, that's what the Democrats would like to have us think, that you know, there's more Latinos, uh, uh, the racial structure is changing, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, women are just not going to put up with the same kind of uh, patriarchal politics that the Republicans have every, every time around. Therefore, the Democrats are on the road to a permanent majority. That's not true. Never underestimate the chance for the Democrats to screw that crap up uh, uh, because they continue to kowtow to the corporate interest. That's where their money comes from. Right? They're, they're, they're completely stuck in those coffers, and they're not allowed to, for example, uh, uh, Cuomo, for example, you know, he's, he's in the pockets of the energy companies that want to do shale gas uh, 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 fracking in upstate New York and all these kind of, uh, kinds of things. Um, I think actually what's somewhat more likely, uh, sort of contrary to what Carl was leaning, is that perhaps the Republicans go the way of the Whigs. Uh, uh, maybe not in an immediate sense, but that they perhaps break apart and that a wing of the ruling class, you know, you know firmly says, well, we've got to get behind the Democrats. And that that would then open up a large space, which you can already see evidence of opening up, to the left to actually form independent groups, not to break apart the Democrats from within, but to form independent uh, 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 workers and social movement and progressive uh, uh, parties, or a party, uh, uh, outside of that. A um, few other things I wanted to say, uh, um, going from that, the, the fact that we haven't had these grassroots organizations, that, uh, political organizations, that perhaps the role of such uh, uh, grassroots parties that you know, exist in a national sense, but have to start somewhere locally, um, perhaps they have a bigger role to play now than at any time in the past. If we look at the time when perhaps the Democratic Party was the most, uh, had the most social movement uh, uh, influx in the late 60s, early 70s, the McGovern campaign, etc., uh, uh, even then, that was at a time when labor was at its pinnacle as a deal maker. George Meany and the whole, you know, the AFL CIO at that time was, they were big players. No one in Washington or mainstream politics takes the labor movement seriously today at all. It's a shadow of, of its former self, notwithstanding the heroic efforts of people like uh, uh, Seamus inside one of the few national unions, NNU, uh, that's like a bright spot in the, the dim uh, uh, picture of, of uh, union organizing today. But perhaps forming mass parties, political parties that are independent and represent working people and oppress people across the country, maybe those need to play the role today that unions have played in the past and can have help, perhaps help to reignite uh, the labor movement, so I'll, I'll stop there. Okay, great, and then we'll go to Matt. Matt. Can I just ask that people actually ask questions? Are we going to ask no. questions? No. Uh, I will ask a question, actually. But yeah, also I'll try to, keep it, try to keep it below, like, uh, you know, 90 seconds or less. Okay, yeah, we need to bring back some, um, you, you've heard the phrase red meat. It's, it's a Republican thing. It's like these, like, you know, dirt, dirt things that Republicans just really rally around and love in this really, like, knee-jerk way. And I think, um, I think leftists need to, like, bring back their own version or, of like red meat, which is class warfare. I think that's this thing that really gutturally um, a, a lot of people identify with it, and I, I think it's why Occupy happened. Um, and I think that um, that's why I think a socialist party is the future of the third party scene. Honestly, um, and it, there's a lot of uh, the, a Gallup poll in 2012 said 46 percent of people, I think, in a 18 to 29 age range, um, think of the Word socialism as a good thing, and 36% of the U.S. population as a whole. That's, that's pretty tremendous, in my opinion. Um, 
So uh, one thing that I've wanted to hear more about is regroupment that you know, people don't take social seriously because they're all, I mean, there's a number of reasons, but one of the big ones is that they're all fragmented, you know, and I, th I thought regroupment was going to be more of like something talked about this conference or this forum, and I haven't heard very much about it. People like uh, Baskar Sunkar, who I thought was about it, he hasn't seemed to be saying much about it. Um, so I want to hear more about 